In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Dear brothers and sisters, I have a wee confession to make to you all, and that is that the Archbishop has, by his authority, uh, decreed that at least once a year, all clergy need to preach a sermon on tithing, on stewardship. And this is now my 15th year of priesthood, and before that seven years as a deacon, and many, many sermons later, I have yet to preach a sermon directly on this subject. It's a difficult one for us to broach, it's a difficult and awkward one sometimes to raise in the church, but let's do that this morning. In fact, this morning, the topic rather beats us around the head. We have a convergence of this epistle, second epistle to the Corinthians and St. Paul talking about this subject with this parable from the Gospel of St. Luke. And if you recall that after the Feast of the Cross each year we jump in terms of the, the Gospel readings to begin to read from Luke. So it's only every so many years that these, this epistle comes together with this Gospel. The last time actually I did look it up was 11 years ago. So there's not many times where this happens. And not only that, we have this morning the commemoration of the Apostle James, the brother of the Lord. And in his epistle, which is probably, it's pretty widely assumed to be, the earliest writing in the New Testament, written around the year 46. Well, in the fifth chapter of that epistle, St. James has this to say to us, to all those who are wealthy. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be evidenced against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure for the last days. Behold the wages of the laborers who mowed the, your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have killed the righteous man, and he does not resist you. Sharp words indeed, <coughs> but as interesting as that is, let's return, as we have been doing over the last few Sundays, to the second epistle to the Corinthians. Because in chapters 8 and 9 of that epistle, St. Paul pivots and begins to look at this question of giving and of generosity. Let us recall what he said so far to, to these Corinthians, those living in a city not unlike ours, a cosmopolitan city where there is so much going on, the hustle and bustle of the world, all the philosophies and beliefs you could imagine and all of the practices of humanity that have ever been devised in one place. And he's told these Corinthians first that to be truly Christians, they must embody in themselves the very gospel itself, both the suffering, the dying of Christ, as well as the resurrection. He's told them as well to dedicate themselves without fail to the life of the church, with single-mindedness and he's told them as we were reflecting last week that they must come out from the world they must assemble as church ecclesia coming out of the world not to condemn the world ultimately but in order that the world through their prayers their sacrifices might ultimately be saved this single-mindedness this total dedication is what he's been calling the corinthians to and as I say, he, in kind of modern political debate speak, pivots in chapter 8 and begins to address a completely different subject. And some scholars have even speculated, is this perhaps a different letter of the Apostle that has been kind of redacted into this one? But as we shall see, in fact, it continues these same themes, although he now broaches the topic of giving, of stewardship, of time. In these chapters 8 and 9 of the epistle, second epistle to the Corinthians, there is, in fact, an entire theology of giving that is outlined. 
He says, first of all, that giving is essential. It's a means of grace. It's actually the measure of our spiritual progress, a kind of yardstick of our devotion. And secondly, it has to be in proportion to what we have. Although he goes on to praise the Macedonians, with whom he has already addressed the subject, for their giving beyond what they were capable of doing. Christian giving, he says, also must be sacrificial. It has to be a reflection of the Lord Jesus himself who empties himself for our sakes. He becomes poor, that we become rich. It must also be voluntary and cheerful. And giving provides a good example to others and must lead to thanksgiving. Well, in these chapters and elsewhere in the Holy Scriptures, the theology is pretty clear. So why is it that in the church we see so little of this? We come up with all kinds of sociocultural reasons. Oh, well, it wasn't like that in the old country, right? That's the church was looked after by the state. We're not used to this. It's not part of our culture. Tithe, church, isn't, isn't that just an Old Testament thing? Or worse, a Protestant thing. There's something to be avoided by Orthodox. We don't have it in us. These are all true to some extent or another. However, they're not really the real reason why we don't see true sacrificial giving in the church. There are, of course, those who do, but so many don't. So what is the real reason that we don't see this amongst Orthodox? I believe it's because we don't really understand the reason for it. We don't really get that theology. And the first and most important part of that theology of giving is that it's essential. It is, in fact, what enables us to be saved. It's essential for our salvation. Now, we need to be careful here because I'm not talking about buying our way into heaven, paying off God that we can get a ticket into through the pearly gates, pay Peter uh, the right fee or, or ticket price. Not at all. The reason tithing is essential for our salvation is that it's the way in which we offer ourselves up. It is the way that we open ourselves to his healing grace and his mercy, his blessing. You know, it's a basic principle, we know this in so many aspects of the Christian life, that unless we open ourselves to God, then his grace doesn't penetrate into us. We talk all the time about the disciplines of the spiritual life, about the need to fast, the need to keep vigil, the need to, to come to church and to, to offer our repentance, our, our broken and contrite hearts, that God can penetrate us with his grace and love. He can't and chooses not to enter into a heart that is infirm. And tithing is one of the clearest expressions of our self-offering, of our opening ourselves up to God. How can he fill us if we are full? How can he fill us? if we are not vessels open to his grace. So tithing, like fasting, like repentance, opens ourselves up, helps us to empty ourselves and become vessels. And whatever it is we have, we have to give to God. And if that's money, we have to give money. If it's time, we have to give our time. Whatever it is we have, we must give it, or else we will not be empty and be able to be filled with Money, yes, money. In our culture that is so grasping and possessing of riches, then surely this is a point of hurt, a real point of wound in our, in our lives. And we must, if we wish to be healed of that, also loosen our purse strings and offer that up to God. Archbishop Dimitri of blessed memory, who was the Archbishop of the Diocese of the South of the Orthodox Church in America, and many consider him to be a great saint, and possibly in the years to come he will be recognized and glorified as such.
but he wrote for the Archdiocesan, um, or the All-American Council, rather, in 1973, an article on stewardship, on tithing, and he says precisely this. The concept of total commitment, total commitment, and think back to St. Paul writing to the Corinthians and asking for their total commitment to this person, Christ. The concept of total commitment, which is the only acceptable way of life for a Christian. There's no other way of being a Christian. There's no Christian by half measures. There's no Christian by kind of dabbling in it as a hobby. The only way to be a Christian is to offer this total commitment. And it should be understood, he says, that there is a close relationship between the spiritual life and one's financial commitment to the church. Over and over again in the Bible, it is made clear that one's willingness to give of his possessions to God's work is the measure of his willingness to give himself. And giving oneself completely is the only acceptable offering. Do we wish for our offerings in our worship, in our prayers, in our life to be acceptable to God? The only acceptable offering is a complete giving of ourselves. Not, as I say, a half measure. Not, as I say, a little portion, but the whole of ourselves. For where your treasure is, Archbishop Dimitri goes on to quote, there will your heart be also. So how much do we give? How much do we offer? What do we sacrifice? Really, the question should be framed as, how serious are we about receiving God's blessing? How earnest are we for his grace? Now, of course, famously in the Old Testament, the, the figure was a tithe, literally a tenth. A tenth of the harvest, a tenth of the livestock, a tenth of whatever it was that was produced. And although, actually, if you go back and carefully look at it, there were different tithes, and it kind of added up to about 23%. Many of the fathers, though, point out that the tithe is superseded in the New Testament. That, in fact, um, the New Testament, the Gospel recognizes that it is all of our life that we must offer to God. It is a complete giving that we should return. We should give back to Him all that we have, or at least the first portion of our treasures, keeping back only what we need. In other words, it's quite right to say tithing is not orthodox, because to be orthodox is to be 100%. Now, we may not be there yet. Just like with fasting, just like with prayer, just like with our worship and our, our, our life of, of spiritual commitment. But the point is to be serious. Remember, the spiritual life is all-encompassing. The Christian life is not about dabbling. It's about coming out of the world and assembling as God's holy people, as his sons and daughters, with God as our Father. So we need to ask ourselves, how much is it that would be serious? Where does giving to the church rank in our expenditure compared to entertainments or luxuries or other things? For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Where we put our money proves where our hearts are and shows the investments of our souls. So as St. Paul says to the Corinthians, give proof, give proof before the churches of your love. For St. Paul in chapters 8 and 9 of the letter, second letter to the Corinthians, it all begins with the grace and generosity of God himself. Listen to what he says. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for his sake he became, for your sake he became poor, that by his poverty you might become rich. And so here is where, as I say, there is a consistency with what St. Paul said earlier in his letter. And just as the gospel itself, the dying of Christ, and the rising of Christ must be somehow embodied in our life, carried about in our very flesh. As St. Paul says, the dying of the Lord Jesus is carried in us, that the life of the light of the resurrection might be fulfilled. So too, the generosity of God must be embedded into our lives. It begins with God's grace, with his giving to us, 
And it, it continues with our response to that grace and that love and our returning to him of all that he gives to us and our return to him in thanksgiving. That is to be the pattern of our life. As St. Paul writes, God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance so that you may always have enough of everything and may provide in abundance for every good work. Grace, generosity, and finally gratitude. These are not optional extras in the Christian life, but the very heart of it, the very pattern of it. It begins with God's grace and generosity for us, and it is our self-offering and return to him of everything he gives to us in the great thanksgiving. And of course, this connects us directly to this action that we do together here, taken out of the world, joined and assembled as the ecclesia, the, the, those called out of the world to offer this praise, this sacrifice, this thanksgiving, this Eucharist here in the divine liturgy. Because the divine liturgy itself is to be the pattern of our lives. It is here that we experience God's grace and love, the saving love which he offers for us. And it is here that we bring our offerings of ourselves, of our hearts, of our minds, of our talents, of our time, and yes, indeed, of the wealth that God has blessed us with and sacrificially offering that on behalf of the world. Vicariously, we pray for the world and we transform the world. Notice the conclusion of this morning's epistle is replete with the language of the liturgy. I'll read it to you with the English translation that we have, and then I will read it to you again, transliterating some of those words from the Greek so you will see just how significant the liturgy is. St. Paul writes, You will be enriched in every way for great generosity, through which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the rendering of this service not only supplies the wants of the saints, but also overflows in many thanksgivings to God. By the proof of this service, you will glorify God by your obedience in acknowledging the gospel of Christ, and by the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you, because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. And now, bringing to the fore liturgical terms in the background here. You will be enriched in every way for great generosity, which through us will produce Eucharist to God. For the diaconia, diaconal service of this liturgy, not only supplies the wants of the saints, but also overflows in many Eucharists to God. By the proof of this diaconia, diaconal service, you will glorify God by your obedience in acknowledging the gospel and the evangelium of Christ, and by the generosity of your kinonia, communion for them and for others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God, Eucharist, for his inexpressible gift. Archbishop Dimitri concludes, it may be startling to hear that the giving of money is an integral part of worship and can in no way be divorced from the spiritual life. But such is the case, for there is no worship without giving or offering. The Christian's life demands a total consecration to God, and this means that every aspect of his life must be sanctified. No one part of his life can be reserved and kept as purely material. There's no part of our world, of this Christian life, that can be left there in the world. When we're called to come out, it's in the entirety of our lives. This worldly concern, for when one refuses to let his wealth be sanctified, then it can become the root of all evils and stand between him and God. This is what happens when we fail to offer ourselves it becomes, those things which we don't offer become the very obstacle to our salvation, the very obstacle to God being able to reach us.
as we saw in such startling terms in this morning's gospel, what, how great a gulf is fixed when that happens. Let us, brothers and sisters, with the example of today's gospel, the examples too of St. James, the brother of the Lord, the apostle, the first bishop of Jerusalem, and his very first right words writing in the New Testament that I read to you this morning, let us be warned that, of that. Let us pray together that God have mercy on us and open our hearts that we may learn truly to open ourselves, to offer ourselves, and to give all that we can, that we may open ourselves fully to his unending love and generosity and 